And I was so saddened by the fact that like, what if I didn't finish? And then all of a sudden, my heart just leapt. And I was like, what if I never finish? What if this is always what's happening? And I'm just living it. Welcome to Task Time Energy, the purpose-filled productivity podcast, where we sometimes talk about time management skills and productivity techniques, but more often we talk a little more philosophically about how we think about time and how we perceive time and ways that we can use the time that we have in a purposeful and fulfilling way. My name's Scott Miller. I'm your host. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, everyone. Our guest today is Amy Not Parish. Amy, I'm going to, if you don't mind, let you uh, introduce yourself to everyone. Would you like to tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Amy. I'm a personal development coach. I've been doing that for about five years now. I have my own practice, and I also work for a company called Growth Space. I got into coaching after I did a yoga teacher training. I waited tables my whole the whole rest of my life, dropped out of college and fell into waiting tables. And it was a great way to make money and just kind of stuck with it and wanted a change, went back to school in my mid thirties, had to leave school because I got pregnant and <laughs> then just life rolled on. I decided I was going to be a yoga teacher, quickly figured out that was not going to work. And I was going to go back to school to be a therapist. And a friend, I told her about it. And she sent me this email about life coaching. I'd never heard about it before. And as soon as I read it and started looking into it, I knew that was exactly what I was supposed to do. I found IPEC through some research, looking at different, uh, different coach trainings, did the training and opened the doors to my own practice. And here we are. <laughs> Yeah. And IPEC, for people who don't know, is the Institute for Professional Excellence in Coaching. It's a coach training program. They've been around for what, like 30 years now, I think. And so that is how, uh, that's how Amy and I met. Uh, the way the IPEC course works is there are three intensive three-day weekends. It's like three days, 10 hours per day of training. So, and then there's, you know, webinars and uh, practice coaching and assignments in between. But Amy, you were the assistant and assistant trainer in the third in-person module, the third training weekend. And that's how you and I met. That's right. And you are certified through the International Coaching Federation as a professional certified coach. Yep. In addition to your, your certification through IPEC. Yep. I do a lot of uh, ongoing education through a group called Coaches Rising. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of things with embodiment and somatics and mm -hmm. presence and things like that. What is somatics? What does that mean? What is it all about? Somatics is using the intelligence of your body. So a lot of how we direct ourselves is through our thoughts, but your body actually gives you so much information. And if you can get out of the idea that all of your intelligence and directions come from what you're thinking and get into what your body is telling you. Mm -hmm. It's just a different way of, you know, using your intelligence other than just your thoughts. That makes me think of, you know, just my experiences in sports and, you know, like even windsurfing now is, is my hobby. When you first start to windsurf, it's all very, you know, you're standing on basically a surfboard holding up a sail and it's all very <laughs> shaky and you're trying to keep your balance. And once you learn a few basics and then you just relax and let everything balance itself out, it becomes easier and things just fall into place. And it's funny because there's so much that I've learned through physical things that I've done that are amazing lessons for, you know, how we approach things mentally or intellectually. So it's just when you talk about somatics that way, it reminds me of that. Exactly. Like if you, you can't think your way into being a good windsurfer. <laughs> you can't intellectualize windsurfing because your body is picking up 
What direction is the wind blowing? What does the water look like? How is my center of gravity? Where do I need to pull in? Where do I need to let go? And if you get your brain out of the way and let all of the rest of you take in, I mean, you you have all of this information coming in all the time Mm -hmm. that we just don't pay attention to because we've been taught that intellectual is the best way to move through life. But windsurfing is a perfect example of how you really, once you stop thinking about what kind of windsurfer you are, then you actually are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Skydiving was the same way. You know, you, you're, when you first learn to skydive, it's all very stiff and you're trying to think about everything that you do and, you know, you're flopping around like a potato chip. And the more you learn to just relax and make small movements and small adjustments and just kind of lay on the air, like it's a big comfy mattress, then everything becomes much more effortless. And our bodies, because our, our bodies respond so much faster. I mean, you know, think about it when you touch something hot and your hand just instinctively jumps away, right? As opposed to having to, to carefully think your way through something. So it makes so much sense that, that there's so much there that we can tap into. The best example I have of that is I'm a trail runner. And so I run in the woods and the snakes come out when it gets hot. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times I have been running and leapt over a copperhead (laughs) and only realized what I'd done after I'd already done it. And then I'm like, there it is. Yeah. My body picked it up before I did. Yeah. It's just such an incredible feeling to realize this whole system, like everything is taking things in and my thoughts are just one way of moving through the world. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely something I've, I experienced in skydiving is the idea of, you know, I would do something in the air and then get on the ground and figure out how I did it, (laughs) right? Like, wow, how did I do that? That was fun. I've been skydiving twice. So I went, I'm terrified of heights, Mm -hmm. terrified. And so I decided for my 30th birthday, I was going to go. And I just went and I did it. And I just remember standing, you know, I had somebody on my back, did it tandem. And I just remember like being like, okay, you just do this. Mm -hmm. And it was, I just could not believe how amazing it was when I just was like, oh, there's nothing I can do. I might as well just let go. Right. But it's the same thing. Like just, I didn't think my way down 13,000 feet. Right. I just did it. I just let my body do it. So you and I met for lunch about a week ago and just had this awesome conversation. And we're talking about some things that tie into some of the themes in this podcast. We were talking about the whole process of starting a coaching business. So many of us get into this line of work and become coaches because we have an interest in maybe helping people. I think that's why a lot of us get into it, right? Um, or we have an interest in a certain aspect of coaching. Like with me, it's you know time management and productivity. And then we go through the training and we start coaching and we're out there and and then we realize, oh, wait, (laughs) I have to run a business. Like I am a a business owner now. And I I just really enjoyed the way that you talked about your approach to that. One of the things that I clearly remember, like from starting you know, from scratch. I mean, I'd never run a business. I didn't know anything about being, you know, a business owner. I just knew that this was that what I wanted to do. And I didn't want to work for somebody else. I really wanted to do these things for myself. And I quickly learned that the way that a business runs, it, there's so many little pieces of it that are all you. And for me, I wanted to spend my time doing the things that I loved, learning about human development, learning about personal development. And I just relied on my skill and sort of word of mouth. And I didn't, 
I didn't spend a lot of time scurrying. I quickly figured out that there was a lot of busy work that I could be doing. And I, it just didn't feel like a wise use of my time. Mm -hmm. And I also realized that it's a long game. And as soon as I realized that this business is something I'm building for the rest of my life, it wasn't something that was going to happen in a flash and then I was going to arrive. And it, it's something that continues. It compounds over and over and over, daily, monthly, yearly. And once I got that long view of this is a fixture in my life, it gave me the freedom to actually like get into it. That it wasn't going to disappear. Like if I didn't do this one thing right, my business was going to be over. It was just information. Oh, not going to do that again. Let's go a different direction. I love that you use the word scurrying because that's like, it's so descriptive of, and I've, I've found myself doing that. It's like being a little squirrel on the ground and you're just bouncing around and up and down trees. And it's so useful sometimes to pause and say, okay, wait a minute. I know I'm doing things right now, but are they what I want to be doing? Are they helping me with the outcomes that I want to achieve? You know, am I just moving around, jumping up and down trees and bouncing off walls? And it feels like I'm doing something because I'm moving, but am I really doing, you know, so is it intentional? Well, and is it mine? That's, that was the most important thing to me is I would look out into the world and see, you know, examples of how to build a business, how to build a successful business, you know, and now when I started, it wasn't as prevalent as it is. I mean, we're just saturated with, you know, how to build a successful entrepreneur, you know, be this in just two weeks, you can make $40,000 a month. Mm -hmm. There's just so much out there. But what I really did was listen to myself. Mm -hmm. And I stayed in that kind of beginner's mindset of like, I've not done this before. So I'm not an expert. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go through and do and just keep trying things. Some things will work. Some things won't. It's almost like talking about it now. It's almost like understanding that this is who I am and what I do. That's permanent. My business will change. It will ebb and flow. Sometimes it's going to be really busy. Sometimes, well, suddenly, you know, things are slow. That isn't a, a statement of how I'm doing long term. And just getting used to the idea that I had to do it my way. And I didn't feel like, you know, a bunch of Instagram reels with me pointing at things. That wasn't me. So the important thing is, I think, to take the time to figure out what actually works for you and not spending a lot of time chasing what's working for other people. There's a lot of wisdom in that because let's forget Instagram and social media and go back, you know, 20 years ago. And if you were talking to someone who is a successful salesperson, let's say. You know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you're talking to somebody who's a successful salesperson. They might say that their success depends on building relationships with people. Dale Carnegie, Dale Carnegie course, how to make friends and influence people, right? Like how long, how long has that been around? And if you read that book, it's very interesting because it's about how you connect with people, connection and relationships. And so much of that is about who you are as a person and people trusting you as a person. So it's the same thing now that, that we see on social media and all the different advertisements and offerings of how to build your business. And the information that has been most helpful for me has been about bringing your authentic self. Well, exactly. And the thing that I'm, you know, ostensibly selling is me. <laughs> and so if I'm not trusting myself and being myself, 
what am I selling? Yeah. And that's a big, you know, that's a big thing about what I focus on with people is like finding yourself in all of the noise, which is how getting into your body can be really helpful. What I hear from conversations with people or, you know, look at posts on social media and there's, especially with people who are starting their own business or uh, trying to start a career or students who are starting college and trying to pick their, their, you know, direction in life, their major field of study, whatever it is there. So many people have this sense of urgency and this there's, which is, it's, it's okay. in sometimes to have a sense of urgency to be motivated, but there's almost like a sense of panic and anxiety going along with that, that it's going to be a disaster if I don't do the right thing now. And when you talk to people who've had different experiences in life, I guess it comes back to that conversation we were having about patience, right? Being patient, trusting yourself and trusting something bigger than yourself too. Taking steps to move in the direction that we want to move while also understanding that things are going to develop in a certain way and that we don't necessarily know how things are going to develop and we don't necessarily control that. The sense of urgency that's kind of built into us from the time that we're like tiny, you know, you're in first grade, second grade, you're learning your multiplication tables. Here's 50 problems. Do them in two minutes. Go, 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 go. It completely defeats the idea of critical thinking. When you're working under duress, you're, you've got your blinders on. All you see is ahead of you. When you're working with an expanse of time, you can see the landscape. The other thing that like just really helped me so much was when things don't turn out the way that I wanted them to, like, oh, that was disappointing. Disappointment for me is not a character judgment. It's information. It's totally neutral. And I think sometimes we get caught in that urgency of trying to make the right decision and do the right thing. Forgetting that the wrong, whatever, thing is also only information. Yeah. And that just opens up a whole world of choices, decisions from yourself, not from a place of I'm making this out of self-judgment, but I'm making a decision for myself. It connects with something you said earlier about learning and, you know, making a choice and it doesn't work out. And, you know, you just said, oops, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> you know, and that attitude is so helpful because so much of what we're doing, especially if you're, if you're not following in someone else's footsteps, exactly, you know, you're not trying to emulate exactly what someone else is doing. You're, you're doing things your own way. You're bringing your own self to whatever you're doing you're a bit of a trailblazer and there's experimentation that goes along with that. There's some trial and error and learning. And when, you know, when we feel like we have to make the right decision right now, it just interferes with that to such a great degree with the experimenting and the learning that ends up being so valuable and leads to, I don't know, in my personal experience, uh, some of the greatest opportunities I've had have resulted from trying something and having it not be what I had hoped it would be the first time. Yes. It makes me think about what you were, when you were talking about windsurfing earlier, instead of being in control of what you're doing, you're being in charge of it. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Do you know Simon Sinek? Have you ever heard of him? He does. He talks about something infinite mindset, which is like, there's no right or wrong. You're just trying to stay in the game. And I just love that idea of just like the whole point isn't to be right or wrong, but just to stay in the game. Well, right. It's interesting when we talk about right or wrong and what we mean by right or wrong, because we attach so much judgment to it. So it's that awareness of the tendency to judge ourselves based on 
things we do that don't work out the way we expect. And that just gets so much gets in the way of, of being open to opportunities, right? Well, yeah. And it makes me think about how we rush things, you know? And mm-hmm. so if I'm in the process of trying to figure something out and it doesn't work out, instead of taking the time to look at, okay, well, what happened? Why didn't this work out? It's so much easier to just be like, it's my fault. I suck. That's why it didn't work out. <laughs> Let's keep going. Yeah. Instead of being able to say, oh, well, that didn't work. What happened? What was my part in it? Okay. What was the other things part, people's part, timing part in it? Oh, okay. That's good information. And then it's just information and it's not making meaning about who you are. Mm -hmm. But it seems very sort of automatic that we just kind of go, oh, well, that didn't work. It was me. I suck. Yeah. I'm the worst. Yeah. And what does that do? Blinders. Yeah. You just go into that hole. So many of the things we do are for the purpose of efficiency, right? Conserving (laughs) energy. Because we only have so much, you know, so many calories to to burn, you know, and like, if we go back to let's, let's go back to our caveman days, because, you know, that's when, you know, so much of our, our physically and, and, and our brains are still, you know, hardwired that way. You know, you've only got so much food to eat. You only have so many hours in a day and there are benefits to doing things efficiently as efficiently as possible. And the way you said that just made me think that some of the, the ways that we judge ourselves and judge other people are really efficient. You know, whether it's accurate or not, it's really efficient. It's really simple. And that, that it, it makes sense. The, the appeal makes sense when you look at it that way, rather than taking the time to say, okay, well, this is, this doesn't mean that I suck. This doesn't mean that you suck. This is valuable information. This is useful information. So let's take some time to parse through that information, see what we can learn, draw some conclusions from that, and then try again. It takes a little more effort to do that got to run a few more calories through our brains to do that. Yeah. And it makes me think about even taking that a step further and understanding that like the mental energy that you're using to berate yourself or, you know, tell yourself you suck, like that energy could be directed at learning instead. Like that energy is being used. Mm -hmm. If I do something and then it's, you know, bombs. And then I, God, I suck. God, I'm the worst. Why do I always do things like that? Or I could shift and change the question to what happened? Like, I think we're using the energy. We're just using it in a way that isn't really helpful. And it's subconscious. So it takes effort to shift it to what's a better question rather than I'm the worst. But if you practice that enough, that becomes the automatic response. And a lot of the ways that we do things are just automatic from long ago. And that's one of the reasons why I love coaching is because it really helps you take a look at who you are today, today, and who you want to be in the future. And what are the things that you're doing that are stale, that aren't fresh? And then one of the things I always tell people is it's going to feel weird. And that means it's going well. (laughs) A lot of the time you feel like this, whatever it is, is supposed to feel like this is supposed to feel really great because I'm changing into what I really want to be. But like you said, you know, when you first get started, it's super awkward. It's awkward or it feels weird. The other thing that I was thinking about while you were talking was the fact that like it's an ongoing thing. Often it seems like we want like we're we're waiting to arrive so that the rush completes. But we're also rushing endlessly. If you're learning how to win surf, First, you suck and it's awkward and it doesn't make sense and it takes a lot of energy, but then you figure out the mechanics and you figure out how it works and then it becomes easier and then you can do tricks and then it feels more automatic. 
And when you're rushing and something is hard, it seems like it would just make sense to abandon it Mm -hmm. because it's getting in the way of your efficiency. But efficiency is created. It's not sudden. It's a system of processes that smooths itself out over time and becomes automatic. And so that goes back to our talking about patience. Yeah. And can you have the patience to let the process smooth so that you can keep going? Because otherwise, if you go out with your, you know, your board and your sale, and maybe you do it twice, and then you're like, whatever, this sucks. You're always a beginner. It's like me and guitar. I have journal entries from 25 years ago. I want to learn how to play the guitar. I have two guitars in my house. I have never learned how to play because I sit down, I try, my fingers hurt, I can't, I put it down. It's the same thing. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. I don't know what I'm doing. You have to push past that point so that it smooths out. Mm-hmm. And that's the patient and also persistence. You know, for someone who is maybe running their own business or starting their own business or someone who is a leader, someone who is, you know, trying to succeed in their profession or in school, a couple of the things that you said are important to listen to or really helpful to listen to and hear. And one is the discomfort that you were talking about. You know, especially when we think of our goals in life or becoming the type of person that we want to be. And we think of that goal as something that's going to feel good, right? So, oh, if I'm, you know, 10 pounds lighter and I'm able to, you know, run farther or do more push ups or whatever, or, you know, that's going to feel so good. And what we don't think about is the discomfort that it's going to take to make that change. Because we don't live in the moment. <laughs> yeah. Because the discomfort is part of the moment, right? Or that we're with a, one of the moments that we will experience to get there. And then also the rushing. You talked about ending the rushing, right? When we're, in, when we're in kind of that panicked, I have to do it exactly right right now. You know, when we're in that moment, when we're in that mindset, there's this idea that if we just rush, rush, rush and get it done, there'll be that relief of the rush ending, the pressure ending, the stress ending. And yet when we get there, when we finish, and maybe we end up, you know, in this place where the pressure isn't there anymore, what do we do? We go looking for more stress. We go looking for more pressure. We go looking for the next thing to put ourselves under pressure with, right? Yes. Um, I don't know. Is that, does that make sense? Am I, oh my gosh. Just it me makes or? complete sense. Like one of the things that happened to me, I quit drinking almost 10 years ago. And I remember maybe like a year and a half into being sober, I was out for a run and I was running and I started to think, what if I never finish? Like, what if I never finish getting to this place of sobriety, whatever that finish was. Mm -hmm. And I was so saddened by the fact that like, what if I didn't finish? And then all of a sudden, my heart just leapt and I was like, what if I never finish? What if this is always what's happening and I'm just living it? And it was such a relief to not have this like imaginary finish line that just kept moving away from me. It just didn't exist anymore. And there were things that I would accomplish. There were milestones that I would reach. But that was the point. The point wasn't to be done. Mm -hmm. It was just, like you said, then you just move on to the next thing. But if I'm not grabbing at that finish line, then I'm not rushing the middle, which means that I can feel the discomfort. Mm-hmm. and be with the experience as it's happening mm-hmm. and be supportive of myself 
you know, it's kind of like if you're out running a marathon and, you know, they have the tables with the oranges and the water and the gels and all the things that help you run 26 miles. But if you didn't have that there, it would suck. (laughs) And you have to keep those tables there for yourself as you're going. And then maybe, yes, you finish that race, but you're still a runner Mm -hmm. or a windsurfer or a skydiver or a person who's trying to accomplish a goal. And if it's not over when you get there, how does that change everything? Yeah. You know, I love these examples you're giving, Amy, because we talk about things like being in the moment. We talk, you know, we say things like, it's not the destination, it's the journey. We hear those things, we nod our head and say, yeah, that sounds really great, but it can be very abstract. Well, it's not either or, it's both, both and. It is the destination and the journey. It's both. You don't have to choose which one. You get to pick both. When I'm running, I can be in the running and I can also be looking forward to being finished. Mm -hmm. But if I pick one or the other, I'm shortchanging the whole experience. Right. And is that where we get lost that we feel like we have to choose? Because if I think about like setting up my business, if all I'm looking for is like, oh, I just want to be done setting up this business. Well, then Mm -hmm. once I'm done with that, my business is over. Mm -hmm. Because I'm I'm closing my doors because I'm done with my business. Mm -hmm. But I, I want the goal, you know, keeping goals keeps me going. So to me, it has to be both. It has to be the ability to go back and forth, both and, both and, both the experience and the goal. What you're describing seems like the exact tendency that we have. I mean, I think very, very naturally, many of us are focused on the outcome that we want and we focus on the goals. But then there's also that shift of being in the moment. And I think there can be a thought around that or some thinking around that or a mindset that, oh, so the goals are bad, right? It's just all about being in the moment. And you don't have to give up on one or the other. It's, it's really embracing the full experience of the moment and the outcome that you want to create. Uh, yeah, allows us to really fully live that and fully accomplish that, whether it's you know, it's, it's a, a task that I'm working on right now, whether it's doing laundry, whether it's starting my business, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, you know, creating a marketing campaign. I mean, there's whatever we're doing when we embrace the full experience, the outcome that we want and the process of getting there. That's when we're most I don't know, alive is the word that comes to mind, but also benefiting from the experience too. Well, yeah, because you're a full human. You're a full, (laughs) having a full experience. You're not having a half of an experience. You're having the whole experience. Well, and it makes me think about what we were saying earlier. Like when you're rushing, you're just in that one part of the experience. But when you can see the whole thing, then you're having a whole experience, which to me kind of creates a fullness of time, like a sense of time being not strained or strung thin like a stretch rubber band but like that that your your moments are full yeah it's it's a great visual like the idea of thinking about time as this stretched rubber band that's always under tension always under stress under stress under pressure versus something that in each moment is like, is I'm thinking of like a, a full glass, right? Or like a full jar, something that is full, something that is complete in each moment, right? As we're doing it. And at the end, it does, we don't have to wait until the end before the, the jar is full, before the bowl is full. Right. It's in each moment, it can be full. Well, yeah. Well, and I think a lot about, particularly in my business, one of the things I really tried to do was to remember like, 
I'm never going to be in this beginning place like this again. I will never be just starting out again. Like, mm-hmm. I will never be this person who, like, doesn't know how to make a website, who doesn't know how to talk to my clients well yet, who doesn't know how to manage my time well. Like, I'll, I'll, I won't be this person again. And so to really be with, that moment of my learning and where I am, but also looking towards like, and one day I will. Mm -hmm. And I'll look back on these days of like, you know, having a couple people that I work with as my first client and looking back at that time with fondness and appreciation for who I was then, because then it gives you the, you can see the journey and you see like, oh, I've met goals and I still keep going. Yeah. And and when we start thinking about it that way, I think there's an even another shift we can make from someone who isn't good at making a website or someone who isn't as good at talking to clients as I would like to be. But then we even make the next shift and say, oh, well, I'm just as good at making a website as, as somebody would be at this point. I'm just as good at talking to clients as someone would be at this point. Like I'm just right where I'm right where I am right now. And this is perfect where I am. I want to be respectful of your time. I want to be respectful of our, our listeners time. Anything else you want to add or you're thinking about before we, uh, before we wrap it up? I think the thing that if I would give, to someone would be the appreciation of who we are ourselves and where we are and to not rush past it. Mm -hmm. Like our sense of urgency comes from within Mm. and that there's always a few seconds to stop, take a second, get information from your whole being your whole body from your body not just your thoughts Tara Brock does Dharma talks and in one of her favorite one of my favorite things that she quotes from someone else who is a mom dying of cancer and she says I don't have time to rush Mm -hmm. and so I think that's what I would say is like we don't have time to rush Yeah, we can at times, it's a useful tool. You know, there are times where it's useful to uh, just go as full blast as fast as we can. You know, that can be useful, but it's a tool and not necessarily the right tool for every job. You know, and and I, I love what you said a moment ago, our sense of urgency comes from within. It is so true. And we tend to point outward. We tend, oh, but my boss needs this by tomorrow, or my, you know, my clients need this by tomorrow. And those things may be true. Those facts may be true that, you know, the boss has told us to have this done by tomorrow. The client has said they want this by tomorrow. But the urgency that we feel is coming from within us. And it is because we choose to accept those deadlines. You know, we don't always look at it that way, but that's so important. So important to recognize. Yeah. What's your default? Is urgency your default? And if so, is that working for you? I've been asking people a question at the end of every one of these episodes, and I would love to ask you the same question. What is your dream right now? (gasps) Oh, what is my dream right now? Well, a couple things. I really want to keep growing my practice and learning. Um, I'm just delving into, I've been doing somatics and I'm just delving into language and reading about linguistics and language and how we make words and why we say things the way that we say them. So I think my dream is just to keep learning. I find the human experience entrancing. And I find the ways that people behave 
so interesting. And so I would continue to build my dream of just helping everyone realize their version of themselves and to live in that version of life. Mm. That is my dream. <laughs> well, thank you, Amy. Thank you so much for, for having this conversation today. Oh my God, it was great. I love talking about things like this and how the world works and how we can do it in ways that just give our lives fabric and texture. If you would like to talk with Amy about somatics or language and why we say things the way that we say them, or if you'd like to talk with her about any of the other coaching work that she does, contact her through her website, amynotparish.com. That's A-M-Y-K-N-O-T-T-P-A-R-R-I-S-H dot com, amynotparish dot com. If you've been feeling that sense of urgency that we discussed, and you'd like to use it as a tool instead of feeling overwhelmed by it, or if you would generally like to feel more satisfied with the way that you use your time, I'd love to talk with you about that. You can reach me through my website, scottmillercoaching.com. <laughs>